when that happens. All right. Uh, thanks, Louis. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Sandra McLaren from the University of Melbourne to be uh, speaking uh, at our seminar today on the neogene evolution of the Murray Basin. So she's currently the senior lecturer in structural geology and tectonics uh, at University of Melbourne. Some of you might recognize her when she did her postdoc, uh, ARC postdoctoral fellowship to be specific at RCS and you, uh, some couple of years ago. Her interest is uh, very um, diverse and uh, her primary focus though is on the long-term evolution of lithospheric structure, uh, specifically Australian continent, a bit of Papua New Guinea highlands as well. And she uses multiple different techniques, including uh, looking at uh, the protozoic tectonics, looking at the thermal impacts of granites and also argon thermal chronology. So without further ado, uh, Sandra, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Voon, and thank you everybody for taking some time out of your day to join the seminar today. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be invited to speak at RICS. As, as Voon mentioned, I was a postdoc there, and I'll mention that again um, in, the, in the early part of my talk. So I would like to thank you for the invitation, um, also to Penny, who um, unfortunately wasn't able to join um, today. Um, I'd like to also extend my acknowledgement of country for, to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, whose land I am working on here in my home office in Melbourne, and also all of the Indigenous peoples across the Murray Basin. The Murray Basin, which I will speak of today, spans South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria, so there are many, many Indigenous um, people who have connection to this beautiful country. I would particularly like to mention the Naranyeri, who are the people who live in this lower reaches of the Murray Basin, which is actually where I grew up. Um, they're people that I know and um, I particularly feel their strong connection and custodianship of the land, which I will speak of today. As uh, Voon mentioned, I'm a lecturer at the University of Melbourne in the School of Earth Sciences. Um, as she also mentioned, I've had a number of different um, hats, I suppose, and different uh, research interests as I've journeyed through academia. Largely, my motivation has been understanding the Australian continent and its evolution through time. Today, I would like to give you a little flavour of my story um, and then outline some of the work that we've been doing here at Melbourne um, about the Murray Basin. Exactly this way. Yep, here we go. Um, so Australia is amazing. And one of the reasons that we're all earth scientists, I'm sure, is because we are fascinated by the land and the environment around us, where we, where we live, where we work, where we can visit. And Australia is particularly lucky. We have this extraordinary history that runs from the oldest rocks and minerals um, on the planet, some of them, I should say, which of course everyone at RCS has strong um, understanding and connection of, um, right from this, these oldest rocks, right through to some really unusual and unique um, modern day volcanism um, down here in the southwest part of the continent, and of course, almost every age rock in between. So as Australian geoscientists or geoscientists working in Australia, we have this extraordinary record of evolution to look at. And this was what began me, um, my journey in the earth sciences, and what still gives me motivation, particularly looking at our, at our backyard, essentially. Um, uh, so I guess I give a little bit of my story here. So I began um, as an undergraduate way back in 1993 um, when I began first year geology um, as part of the BSc at the University of Adelaide. Like many of you and many professional um, uh, geologists that you may meet, I was very much an accidental earth scientist. I had not heard of um, geology as a discipline at all before. It wasn't taught at my um, country school um, and I took it as that fourth subject, which is a very common story um, and may also be the story that some of you share. Um, I went on at Adelaide to do my PhD um, and I was looking largely at protozoic aged rocks um, during that work, uh, mainly at the thermal structure of the lithosphere and the impacts of Australia's really highly unusual heat producing element in rich granites, um, the impacts on lithospheric evolution and particularly temperature dependent processes like magnetism and metamorphism. Um, following my finish, the completion of my PhD, um, I moved on as the 
Moon said, I was lucky enough to get an ARC postdoctoral fellowship and moved to RCS. Um, and with that move, um, I had a bit of a change in research direction. And that's when I began um, a fairly short lived, I suppose, in hindsight, career as an argon thermochronologist. And I was really privileged to learn a lot from Ian McDougall and others um, and add a new set of skills to what, um, I, what I already knew about. Um, following that, uh, I moved to Melbourne, and that's when the um, story changed uh, again. Um, sorry, um, I continued some of my wish, some of my research on uh, hot rocks and thermal regimes, but I largely went to Melbourne in order to do a postdoc on this Murray Basin work, a position that they couldn't get anyone to do. So I was kind of like, oh yeah, I'll give that a go. So it's a little bit unusual for people to change as much as I have done, um, I think. Um, and But I've learned a lot from the different projects I've been able to work on and the a wide range of skills that I've been able to pick up. These days, although I still do a little bit of um, research largely with students looking at the thermal structure problem and also tectonics and fold belt evolution, um, my main focus, at least over the last few years, has been my teaching program. So I lead structural geology and tectonics teaching um, at Melbourne. Um, I love this role. It's extremely, uh, I'm an ex in an extremely privileged position to be able to encourage our students on their journey as a scientist, remembering well myself what it was like at the beginning. So this is what I've been thinking about um, a lot over the past few years. And I take this role very seriously. I, I recognize that today's undergraduate students are going to be tomorrow's research high degree students and then into the future, uh, the research workforce. So it's a worthy investment. So what I'm going to talk about today is this work that we um, undertook here at the University of Melbourne, looking at the neogene evolution of the Murray Basin. And you might remember I was describing my PhD as looking at problems of protozoic age tectonics here in Australia. And I was particularly working on the mesoproterozoic, some of the paleoproterozoic and into the neoproterozoic. So this big shift that I had in my research career took me from rocks that are about one and a half billion years old to rocks that were only a few a million years old. So for me having been brought up so to speak in the Proterozoic I was now working with geology that was within the era bars of the ages of the rocks and the ages of the events that I was accustomed to working on. So it was quite a change for me and I learned a lot from that. Um, I absolutely will acknowledge um, this was a team effort. I was working with Malcolm Wallace, um, also with Stephen Gallagher and some students, as well as some collaborators from Lund University in Sweden who will make a, um, some pictorial appearances here in the slides. So many of us, if we've um, uh, spent some time in Australia, may be familiar with the Murray Basin. So the Murray Basin is this broad saucer shaped depot center that I'm hopefully you can see the mouse outlining here um, in southeastern Australia. So it overlaps South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales, oops, um, which is actually a bit of a problem because there are some differences in the stratigraphic names across the borders. There's differences in the definition of units as well and it's also actually quite tricky just to get maps that cover across the different um, border zones. So it's a broad area, it's really important uh, from a contemporary society point of view in terms of a water source for the regional populations and agriculture that's developed throughout this region. Um, it's one of a number of basins that formed on this uh, trailing edge of the of the continent here during the breakup of Australian, the Australian continent from Antarctica. That began about 120 million years or so ago. So there's the Otway Basin down here, southwest of Melbourne, the Gippsland Basin to the east of Melbourne, and various others along, smaller basins along here. But the Murray Basin is by far the largest of those. Um, the total area, depending on how you measure it, is about 300,000 square kilometres. So that's about half the area of France, which we always amazed um, our um, collaborators um, in, in Europe. That's how big and vast this area was, or is, I should say. 
and it's pretty flat. This is the, um, although we can see on the shuttle radar, and this is what this background image is here, and it's also several other versions that you'll see through the talk, the topographic and geomorphic features on here look quite impressive, and you can recognise a series of different features that I'll obviously um, discuss. But when you get out on the ground, this is what you're faced with. Um, there's not that much to see. Uh, this is Ian and Per, who um, were both formerly from Lund University in Sweden, who collaborated with us on this project and they were pretty amused when we were heading north out of Melbourne as things got flatter and flatter until we got to the Murray Basin proper here. This is outside Wentworth and their understated statement was, oh, it's a bit flat. And it certainly is a bit flat. There's not much to see. That is until you get to the um, Murray River itself and outcrops are exposed along the gorges um, and the other regions where the river cuts through the landscape. Um, so we spent a lot of our time looking for outcrop along the river. Um, we should have got a boat but um, we weren't able to do that. Um, it would have given us a, a bit of a, um, an advantage in getting to some of these sites. Um, so we were restricted to the river corridor as well as some quarries and some other um, man-made places where material has been dug out for us to have a look and see what rocks are infilling uh, the basin itself. Um, that is unless you want to start digging and we were lucky enough to have some willing students um, uh, who were prepared to help us dig to some outcrop as a person working in protozoic tectonics and geodynamics. The idea of digging for rocks was, was quite of a, a bit of a novelty for me. Um, a very large hole we dug here to try and get some samples for magnetostratigraphy, which I'll talk about in a moment. So lots of digging, lots of sampling with um, shovels essentially and little trowels. That is unless you're lucky enough to get some money to drill. And we were lucky enough to get some money via our Swedish collaborators. The Swedish Research Council is, um, is not averse to funding um, fieldwork and projects um, external to Sweden. Um, and uh, Ian was uh, successful with the equivalent of an ARC project through the Swedish system for us to do a drilling project uh, up at one of our sites that I'll talk about a bit more um, later on in the talk. But I say those things just to, just to give you a bit of a flavour for the constraints that we had in terms of finding material to work on um, to piece this story together. Okay, so this slide's kind of the summary of some of the key details that I will um, talk about um, and introduce you to the evidence and that we have for the different ages that we have for the different units in the basin and how we've pieced that together to look at the long-term um, environmental and climatic record that these sediments preserve. So this little stratigraphic column here, I'm um, showing the uh, relative age and spatial relationships of some of the key units. You'll see that appear on pretty much all of the, well, not all of them, but most of the slides um, as we go through. And here's some examples of some of these main units that we have here. So I'll begin with um, uh, the older units here. I won't talk too much about those. And I'll focus most of my attention on this seven million year to recent um, period of time and what we can get from what we can get from that. Okay, so these oldest units, um, they sit on the Paleozoic basement, which you can now see in the Adelaide Hills, for example, um, the Paleozoic rocks of the Delamerian origin. The, the oldest Murray Basin group sediments are the Murray group, which sit on top of that. And these are oligomycene in age. Uh, they have lots of uh, marine microfossils that can um, be used to get quite good age constraints. And most of it's at around uh, 15 million years um, ago. So this represents shallow cool water carbonate deposition, which representing a major marine transgression onshore into the Murray Basin at this time. It's quite variable in thickness, this unit, largely because the underlying Paleozoic basement is also um, quite variable in terms of its um, er eroded topography. Um, this is probably what most of us will think about um, in terms of the Murray Basin. Anyone who's been through South Australia would recognise these beautiful golden cliffs here of the, the lower reaches of the, of the Murray River um, in uh, Naranyeri country, as I mentioned before. 
Following the deposition of these marine carbonates, there was a period of non-deposition here, which correlates really well with evidence in those other Southeast Australian basins that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in that there seems to be an onset of tectonism um, at around the Miocene-Pliocene boundary or around 10 million years ago, that's recorded throughout the basins of, the, of Southeast Australia, including the Murray Basin. After that period of non-deposition and tectonism that seems to be uh, evident here, we then have another marine incursion into the basin. And some quite complex uh, set of sediments um, and depositional environments that have been recorded. So in this interval here, sitting on top of the local basement of the Murray Group, um, we have three main units. The Norwest Bend Formation, which is restricted to an estuarine environment here around Morgan in the northern part of the, of the Murray River uh, track in South Australia. Um, the Book Penong Bed, sorry, which is another marginal marine sediment, and the Loxton Perilla Sands, which I'll talk a lot about over the next few slides. That's the major unit associated with this marine incursion. And um, you can see uh, on this map that I've outlined a series of lines that are running sort of west, northwest, and curving around to the south, southeast, um, and ended up running nearly north south as we get down to the southern part of the basin here. And these, uh, this, uh, these are the sediments of the Loxton Perilla Sands, and they extend nearly 500 kilometres um, up to the up to past Menindi um, in northern New South Wales. And these are all outcrops or, or subcrops of the Loxton Perilla Sands shore face sediment, which I'll talk about in a moment. Oops. Okay, so what do these, what is this unit? Um, if we can recognise it all the way up here to the northern uh, top northwest, uh, northeast, sorry, a mouse is moving around. Um, but when we come to look at it, what is this unit? It's a sand, obviously, as indicated by its name, generally unfossiliferous with a few important um, exceptions, generally well sorted quartz sands that can show some beautiful cross beds here um, that we would expect to see in a near shore or dune um, and a swale type environment. The fact that we can recognise these, and if we look back at the previous image, sorry, the previous image, if we look carefully at the shuttle radar topographic data, we can actually count about 600 individual dunes or parts of dunes as we step further inland here. I think the longest one we can trace an individual, sh individual shoreline um, deposit of being about 300 kilometres long. So really quite um, an extraordinary sequence here. Um, and the, the morphology of these in terms of these arcuate shaped ridges that we see, as well as the sedimentology in terms of the um, well sorted sand with nice cross beds and so on, means that this unit has been interpreted to represent paleo dune and swale landforms, a bit like, well, exactly like what you would expect to see at the coast today. If you go, um, if you go for a walk along, along the beach, this is the type of morphology that you would see. And these are preserved way up here um, towards Broken Hill, Menindee area, and all the way through. So this comprises what we call a strand plane sequence. And we have, we have argued that this is the largest preserved strand plane sequence anywhere in the world. You will notice that there are similarities in the orientation of these strand plane um, ridges with the current coastline. So how old are these? So we know that they are younger than the Murray Group limestones, but how old are they exactly? Um, and this is a bit of a problem because dating pure sandy sediment um, in this sort of age bracket is really not very easy. There's not much to go on. Um, I've mentioned that they were largely unfossiliferous and indeed that is true, but at a few very lucky spots we've been able to find some shelly fossils that we've been able to um, measure the strontium isotope composition and match that up with the known variation in strontium isotope um, 
uh, variation in the oceans. So we're able to do this sort of, I guess it's a comparative sort of dating um, technique. We had lots of uh, trial and error with this in finding which shells were um, the most robust and not altered by later uh, surface processes. And we ended up settling on brachiopods, which look a little bit like this, not the best photo of them, um, that we were lucky enough to find in a few different locations um, within the shore face sediment. And so we were able to date those um, and we came up with quite a narrow range of ages for these um, shore face sediments. So the, there's three that I've shown on here um, and there's also another one here from the Book Penong Formation which was the marginal marine sediment that I mentioned was associated with the Loxton Perilla Sands. So this Bukpanong formation, shallow marginal marine sediment, would have been associated with one of these strand lines a little bit further inshore. So we're looking at the shallow um, marine sediment date that would have related to a ridge, uh, a beach ridge forming further inland. So this helps us to be able to constrain the age of the whole strand plane. And you can see the ages neatly step to become younger towards the modern day coastline, which is what we would expect in this sort of prograding sequence. So we've been able to interpret the age of the Loxton Perilla Sands strand plane as being from about 5.4 to about seven and a bit something million years, depending on um, which ages we ignore and which ones we, can, we, we think are more reliable. So this represents a progradation rate of about 130 kilometers per million years as the sands have prograded towards the modern day coastline. But globally, at this particular time interval, it's a pretty stable eustatic sea level. So this is not, um, well, it doesn't seem to be a record of eustatic sea level drop at this particular time. But instead, we make the argument that this is actually representing some sort of broad scale tectonic uplift at this time, which has the effect of course, uplifting the land of moving the shoreline further out um, to the modern coastline today. So quite a significant uh, interpretation we've made there based simply on the ages of these units, the progradation rate and what we recognise is happening globally to sea levels. As well as the Loxton Perilla Sand Strand Plain, which was these units um, that went far inland into South Australia and New South Wales, there's also long been recognised a second strand plane sequence, which is shown on this, sorry, it skips moving, shown on this darker, in these darker colours here. So these lighter colours here with these quite obvious strand line sediments here as the Loxton Perilla Sands strand plane, whereas these ridges here on the darker um, area of the map here that run up to the modern coastline is a second strand plane. Um, and this has been dated quite well using amino acid racemization of little tiny um, uh, fossils and other carbonate material. And there's a nice progression of age here too, from about a million years further inland through to the modern day uh, beach ridges. If anyone's been in that area, this is Robe, um, Beachport and so on, a really beautiful part of the world. Then the progradation rate on this Gambia coastal plain um, formed by the Bridgewater Formation is about 90 kilometres per million years. So that's not that different from what we um, calculated with a lot of assumptions for the Loxton Perilla sand plain, um, sands strand plain sequence. But you will notice that this age is quite a lot younger than the youngest age we got for the Loxton Perilla sand strand plain. So there's about 4 million years missing here, yet the rate of progradation of the older strand plane and the younger strand plane seem to be aboutish the same. Um, and it's well established and well accepted that the uplift here is related to tectonism. So we can make the assumption that the apparent uh, uplift recorded by the Loxton Perilla Sands strand plane is also related to tectonism. So there's some long term signal here affecting the basin dynamics. Okay, so what happened during this four million year um, long gap? The unconformity between about five million years ago and the deposition of the first of the Bridgewater Formation strand plane sequences at about one million year ago. So obviously something pretty significant must be happening here. Um, Malcolm Wallace, who I was working with, has a hypothesis that the 
ancestral Murray River used to come out here in far western Victoria at around, around where Portland, Portland is today. And the argument that we've made is that there has been uplift sometime following five million years, we don't know exactly when, but sometime following five million years, um, or more recently than five million years to be clearer, that has meant that the river drainage here was defeated. So there's uplift happening here in Western Victoria and along the axis of the Kanoinka escarpment to some degree. And basically the river can't keep up. So we end up effectively damming the drainage that's coming off the Eastern Highlands. And during this period, obviously the regional uplift meant that we were exposing our strand plane sequence that was deposited um, uh, earlier. And this period was an intense, um, was, uh, sorry, um, there was intense weathering during this uplift period. And it must have been under wet, very humid conditions because we formed this beautiful um, fairy creek surface here that's called the Karunda surface on top of the Loxton Perilla Sand Strand Plain, which we know was um, finished being deposited about 5 million years ago. And then we have younger sediments sitting on top. So a long period here where we've uplifted um, this part of the continent and there's extreme weathering under quite humid and wet conditions. As well as this uplift um, causing a lot of weathering in these uh, uplifted uh, plains and we think defeat of the ancestral Murray River, which you can see the channel of related to that down in this lower half of the image here. Um, this defeat of the drainage meant that water was backing up essentially behind the uplifted Kanawenka escarpment. And this backup of the water led to the development of um, what we call Mega Lake Bungunya. So an extremely large lake, the, what I have uh, outlined here with the white uh, dashed line is what we think its maximum extent was. Um, so just for references of the Adelaide Hills running through here, um, Menindee Lakes are around here. This is Lake Tyrrell in uh, northwestern part of Victoria. So a really, really extensive lake sequence here. Um, although the shuttle radar uh, image that I'm showing here allows us to see a lot of the details of the lake and the lake morphology, um, it was actually first recognised right back in the late 19th century by Ralph Tate, who's a name um, very well known in South Australian um, geological circles. So from all reports, he got a boat um, up the river um, and was making observations about the, the same outcrops that we were looking at, um, obviously, um, in more recent times. So the fact that there has been a lake here is well recognised, but the age and the evolution of that lake system is much less well understood. Looking at the um, maximum extent, as I've shown here, makes this lake an area aerial extent of about 50,000 square kilometres. So probably or almost certainly one of the largest paleo lakes anywhere in the world. So the formation of the lake must have reflected quite significantly wetter conditions than what characterises the Murray Basin today. We all know this is a really dry part of our country. Um, there's a lot of uh, these player salt lakes around. Um, and so there must have been quite significantly different climatic conditions at the time the lake formed. Um, and this again has been recognised for quite some time. Um, as uh, Walter Houchen, who's another name um, from the old days, recognised that these player lakes, and this is Lake Tyrrell that I've shown here, as I mentioned previously um, in northwestern Victoria, is a remnant or the last contraction of Lake Bangamia that we can still see um, in our environment today. And the drying of Lake Bangamia has long been talked about to be a key stage in the climatic evolution of this part of our continent. But knowing exactly when and how that drying happened um, was what we spent quite a lot of our time um, working on to try it, to try and constrain. So what do the sediments in Lake Bangunya look like? Well, as we mentioned before, this is our local basement, some tectonism, this uh, prograding strand plane sequence between around five and seven million years, then another big gap to form the Karunda surface, and then we've got these sediments sitting on top that were deposited in this mega lake. And there's two main uh, units that we have here. 
The main unit is the Blanchetown clay, and there's a secondary unit I'll talk about at the end, which we call the Bungunya limestone. This lake is obviously very large aerially, but very, very thin. So it's not very deep. Uh, most of the Blanchetown clay and Bungunya limestone units uh, are less than 10 metres in total thickness. And that's shown here in this uh, section from Lirup in South Australia. This um, rounded uh, knobbly bit here is the that Karunda surface ferry creek. This very unpleasant looking rusty uh, material here is the Blanchetown clay and you can see some of the carbonate of the Bungunya limestone sitting up top. Luckily there are some places where we can see these lake sediments a little bit more clearly. Um, and this is our, um, our best section um, in terms of the exceptional exposure of Lake Bungunya sediments, mainly of the Blanchetown clay. So this site is Nampu Station, which pretty much sits at the corner of New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria. Um, and here we have a total thickness of Blanchetown clay of about a bit over 30 metres. And looking at where this is located on the um, larger map of our extent of Lake Bungunya, we think this probably represents the deepest part um, of the lake and sort of the centre, not really the centre geographically, but the deepest, longest lived part of Lake Bungunya. At the bottom of it, it seems to be underlain by a basal sand. And of course, there's some debate as to whether this is Loxton Perilla sand or whether it's a basal sand associated with the initial filling of the lake. And that's been our interpretation um, based on the grain size variation. So a big flooding event sheets in a whole lot of sand into the, and into the bottom of the lake. And from then on in, we start to infill with clay. The main part of the clay um, is quite um, monotonous at first sight, grey green clay here. It has a wonderful um, uh, side property that you get your boots filled up with this stuff and they don't smell. It's um, really quite quite helpful. There should be a market for this stuff um, in, northern, um, in the northern parts of Victoria and New South Wales. Um, this is the same section here and you can see there are some sands at the bottom that have quite prominent mottled horizons in them. So we've interpreted these to represent quite a fluctuating lake level throughout the early stages of the filling of Lake Bungunya. This is what most of the clay looks like um, and there are some little channel sands we interpret in the sequence um, but mostly it's fairly monotonous clay as you can see um, from our stratigraphic section here. Life in the lake is a really, really interesting question. Um, we found very little evidence of life in Lake Bungunya. There are some, this is a little ostracod, um, Iliocypris australiensis um, sars. Um, that's quite a common little ostracod um, that lives in um, moderately saline waters. And we see it in a lot of the inland um, semi-saline lakes today. So we did see that at a few places, but not very much uh, life. No diatoms, no fossil pollen, um, nothing like that, unfortunately. There was, when we looked at the clay in detail, seemingly some cycling of illite and kaolinite in the sequence. So illite would appear and then disappear in cycles that we have tentatively um, uh, related to climate cycling in wet and dry periods. Um, and the most significant part of the lake sequence though, is this unit that we recognize here as the Nampu that we've, we've defined as the Nampu member. And this is this unit that we recognized in the outcrop here, which is about two to three meters thick at the Nampu section. And it's this whitish layer, as you can see within the clay. And it's a series of finely laminated quartz silt and uh, silty sand layers. We do see it lower down, in the sequence here as well, but very, very thin. But there's a, this thickness here, higher up is quite a prominent horizon. And looking at that in detail, um, it has a particular grain size distribution and a almost pure quartz um, composition. There are some clays involved in, with various um, proportions, but it's mostly quartz silt. And silt, of course, being the name we give to a grain size of around 20 or so um, millimetres, a little bit more coarser than clay. And 
when you look at these things on the SEM, they're quite angular, there's no cement here, um, and they look a little bit similar to desert dust or windblown wind blown dust, which um, is sometimes called LERS, although there's a lot of ongoing discussions about whether LERS is the appropriate term for these type of dusty sediment that forms in an inland environment like we see here. They have gradational bases, but really quite sharp tops, as you can see in this section where we cut out here. This is the silt um, and a very, very sharp boundary here back into the clay rich sediment. So we've interpreted these to represent windblown material that's come along and landed in the water of the lake and filling up the lake at that particular time. What's significant about us recognising this is that we've also recognised it at quite, another, at quite a number of other locations throughout the basin. So this is the image I had before showing the extent of Lake Bangunya and these white dots are some of the places where we have observed this silty layer and they're shown here. So quite a large geographic spread, um, obviously different thicknesses in different locations but it's, um, it's almost certainly the same material. That's about 250 or 300 kilometres between this most westerly and most easterly um, location. So we've interpreted this to be a quite a significant event that's marking aridification that's happening somewhere on the continent. So a lot of dust is formed in dry, arid conditions. It's blown across and it's deposited in uh, this Aeolio Lacustrine um, setting. Okay, so how old are these sediments and how old is the lake? Um, but how do you get age constraints on lake sediments that are in this awkward um, time interval of less than 5 million years? Um, you could try some fossils, but we don't have any. Um, you could do some cosmogenic dating of the sands, and that's what I'm um, getting sampling for here. And we still have that um, ongoing at the moment. We don't have a date from that yet, but hopefully we will get that soon. But because there's large amounts of clay here, um, magnetostratigraphy was the way which we could go here. And we did some outcrop magnetostratigraphy and with Brad Pillins actually from, uh, from ANU. And we ended up with this um, observation where we had a dominantly um, uh, reversed uh, polarity with one normal interview, interval. We were able to extrapolate to say that the lake formed at about 2.4 million years and it dried up at about 1.2 million years. With the key date here associated with our Nampu member uh, dust as being about 1.4 to 1.5 million years um, prior to now. Oops. Nope. You will remember that I showed you those pictures of the drilling program earlier. Um, and this was really exciting. We got some beautiful air core um, uh, material from here. We did duplicate holes to make sure we were getting it um, sampled. They were sent to Sweden. Um, I followed them to find out um, what we were doing. Um, but the data from there is quite different from the data that we got from our outcrop samples. So one of those cases of getting more data and regretting it, um, we still actually don't have a, uh, an interpretation that we're happy about for the new data. And it was, it was done at such high resolution um, and we're, we're struggling with that still. So we're sticking with our interpretation based on the outcrop samples for now, um, but we, we clearly need to work through and try and understand what's happening here. Okay, just to end, I know that I'm getting towards the 40 minutes, um, but uh, the last part of the story here is this Bunganya limestone unit that sits on the, the top um, part of the lake. And we know this has to be younger than 1.2 million years, which is the youngest age we've hypothesized for the Blanchetown clay part of the lake. The Bunganya limestone is even harder to sort of see than the Blanchetown clay because it is very thin. So three metres is the maximum um, where we ever found it, but often it's only half a metre to a metre in thickness. And it's a lacustrine carbonate unit that we interpret to represent an ephemeral hypersaline facies, a bit similar to what, the, what would be forming today in, in a place like Shark Bay in Western Australia, for example. Lots of different sedimentary structures that I'll show you on the next few slides. Um, but the, one of the points here I'd like to make is this was previously thought to be a single depositional unit that was observed all the way across um, the lake basin. But our um, looking at the shuttle radar shows that there's a number of quite distinct terraces that we can observe 
within particularly the western part of the um, Lake Bungunya system where the Bungunya limestone is found. And each of these terraces seems to be associated with a distinct shoreline. And we can recognise at least five of these that seem to be sitting at distinct elevations above sea level from about 70 metres, the highest one down to only about 34 metres above sea level. So there's quite a um, distinct uh, topographic variation here. The Blanchetown clay is always found at this highest level, at about 60 metres above sea level, whereas the Bungunya limestone, as we'll see in a moment, is found at different lake levels, which therefore must mean that it is not a single depositional unit. So how did we do this? Some of you might recognise the person shown here, um, Richard Stanaway, who was also my husband, who happens to be a surveyor, did some work at RCS with Paul Trigoning many years ago, um, which is where we met. Um, and very handily, he was able to come out with us and to relate the rocks that we were looking at to their elevations um, above sea level and to see what we could recognise the relationship between the rocks and the terraces that we could see on the shuttle radar. And that showed to us that there were these distinct lake levels that were associated with distinctly different lithologies of that Bungunya limestone. So the higher levels where we saw the Bungunya limestone, um, they had lots of ooids in them, lots of clay-rich interbeds, stromatolites, almost exactly like those ones, as I said, that you would see at Shark Place some, somewhere like Shark Bay. And they were dominated by calcite and aragonite mineralogy. So this is at levels two and three of the Lake Bungunya system that we've been able to, to map out. Lake level four though, the lowest one, seems to be quite different in terms of the rock types, the sedimentary structures and the mineralogy. So we see lots of these tent structures in here, we see mud cracks, um, we see um, gypsum um, dissolution features, um, and so on. And the mineralogy, instead of being dominated by calcite and aragonite, is now dominated by dolomite, gypsum and magnesite. So there's clearly a stronger evaporitic influence when we get down to these um, lower lake levels. So we've interpreted this to represent episodes of, of drying under increasingly arid climatic regimes. So we're going from calcite, aragonite down to gypsum, magnesite dominated. So there's an overall aridification trend that we can see here that also correlates with the progressive shrinking of the lake. So we interpret these terraces and the sediments on them to kind of be like rings on the bath that are representing sediment left behind um, during drier arid glacial periods in between wetter interglacial periods that were characterised by higher rainfall and more open lake conditions. And possibly with the lake um, going over the tectonic dam that we had at the time during the wet periods, but then shrinking to be at um, much lower lake levels during the drier, more arid periods when limestone in the form of the Bungunya limestone was deposited on the terrace that was cut during the previous wetter interglacial. So the demise of Lake Bungunya overall was there some complicated combination of gorge cutting, which I still don't totally understand, um, as well as increasing aridity. So climate has clearly had a big role to play here. If only we could get some ages from this Bungunya limestone, we would be able to track the timing of the lake contraction. We have tried this, a PhD student here at Melbourne, um, working with John Woodhead, did some um, new dates for us of these. Well, he tried to. Um, a lot of clay contamination definitely doesn't help. So the lead levels were really high. So he wasn't able to get an age from those um, at, with the current um, techniques that they have. So that's a real shame. And that's a, a question that we would love to have an answer to. Okay, so just to finish, I think the key points are that the Murray Basin is an extraordinary part of our um, country and our continent, and it preserves a unique record of environmental change, a tectonic story, um, as well as climate change throughout this period. We think Lake Bungunya formed at about two and a half million years ago. It clearly formed under much wetter climatic conditions, which again correlates globally quite well. Um, but the contraction of the lake over time seems to preserve a unique 
and a quite remarkable record of increasing amplitude arid climate cycles throughout the Playa Pleistocene. This trend to aridification is really well preserved um, with a major step recognised by the Nampu member silt that I mentioned, but also subsequent steps coincident with deposition of those different levels of um, carbonate of the Bunganya limestone. And uh, intriguingly to me, going back to my, um, my, where I started, I guess, suppose, is this evidence for some sort of long lived regional tectonic uplift, which again, we still don't uh, fully understand. And this is something that we're still working on to try and understand that, that apparent uplift signature to resolve the timing of aridity, particularly by looking at the Bunganya limestone in the latter stages, and also to extend uh, looking this work by looking at lakes elsewhere in Australia. So there's a number of other lakes in Central and Western Australia where we'd love to be able to, to look for similar silt sequences to see if we can also see markers of increasing aridification um, on, on the continent scale. Okay, I'd be very happy to um, answer uh, any questions. And uh, I'll stop the share now. Thanks, Vreen. Thanks, Louis. Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, we're starting to, well, people are, people are giving symbols of applause, which I, I expect you can see. Um, and uh, we have a good number of participants right now. So um, we will try to be organized and orderly. Uh, so Rodri got in first with a, with a typed in question. I don't know if you want to actually ask that question in person, Rodri, or want me to read it out? Um, I'll just read it out then. Um, <laughs> Rodri says, hi, Sandra, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, and you used the term tectonism or tectonic uplift. Is there a reason you didn't invoke dynamic topography, given there is other evidence for dynamic uplift of Southern Australia in the recent past? Um, yes, really good question, um, Rodri. I'd be love to talk more about with people that know more about this than me. Um, it seems to be going the wrong way to me. So it seems that if the story about dynamic topography that people have spoken about um, uh, previously is that this um, is got tilting up that way, whereas we seem to be it seems to be a north directed tilt and a south down. And I'm not sure if that would it would work. Um, I mentioned I, I mentioned it briefly to Dietmar at one Dietmar Muller at one stage, and he didn't seem to think it was consistent with the broader story that they've spoken about. But I think the timing of it um, to be quasi consistent with what's happening with the volcanism in Western Victoria is also a little bit suspicious that maybe there's some broader upscale, a broader uplift that's superposed on that broader dynamic top topographic signature. But anyone who wants to talk to me about that, I'm all ears. Can I, can I just step in and quickly ask you, you did talk about tilting versus uplift. And so I was just curious what you, you do, is that resolved or is that something you're just, uh, I mean, is that resolved in the, in the survey results that you got? Uh, no. No, it's not resolved at all. So there's more for us to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone who knows more than me about this to explain it. Okay. So I'm going to ask um, Brad, who Brad Obdike, who raised his hand to, um, to see if he'll speak in person. There you go. And then I'll go back to some of the questions in the chat when you finish, Brad. Okay. Hey, Sandra, thank you for the talk. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Okay, good. Um, anyway, I love I, what you made, what, what the, the uh, case you put forth makes a lot of sense, but the one thing that didn't ring true was the damming of Proto Murray. It doesn't make sense in a human climate. It just doesn't. Yeah. The basement that you have through that Proto Murray is still soft in a relative yeah. sense. And so, yeah, that just doesn't work for me. <laughs> no, I totally agree, Brad. And it's the thing that's still, it, it's still, I do not understand how it could ever have, but there's the, the initial damming if we accept the Western Victorian hypothesis. And then there's the um, final breakdown of Lake Bunganya and the 
um, getting the Murray out to the, the current um, sea environment. And that just doesn't make sense to me because you've got an increasingly arid climate. I mean, that's demonstrable everywhere. And so there's going to be less and less power in the, in the drainage to cut through though the, the Murray Group limestones at the current mouth. And that's also the highest part and that's where it's cut through. And I, I do not know. I wish uh, that's the, been the major outstanding question for us. And I know I, I, I'd, um, uh, Malcolm would join me in that, that we still don't quite understand how that's worked. Yeah, that's, it's, yeah, so if I got that to review, that would be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is part of our problem. Yeah. yeah I mean, we've yeah. skirted around it um, because the rest of the story does seem to make sense, but yeah. there's a, a, a piece of the puzzle that's missing that I cannot, yeah, I can't get to. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks again. No worries. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Brad. There's another uh, <clears throat> written question from Martha, which is, uh, you mentioned several regional uplift events. Can you speculate on what caused them and how ex expansive they are? Yes, really good question again. And this is the other thing that sits, sits him uncomfortably in my mind about this. I mean, it's easy as a geologist to say the record seems to suggest this is, you know, going up, but, but what is controlling that? I've, uh, I, I've had a suspicion that I'm sure is wrong. And again, I'd love to talk to people about this, that there's a long wavelength response still to rifting. I think this is too far away, but from, I have seen some models published that do seem to show that there's a long-term uplift a long, long way from the margin. Um, there's people here who know way more about that than me. Um, so the possibilities are a long wavelength thing. We do see this all over the Southern part of, of, of Australia, Southeastern part of Australia, I should say. So it's, it's really perplexing. Um, so the data I mentioned that the PhD student of John Woodhead tried to um, get a date on the Bungani for us. He's seen a very, very similar uplift rate than uh, as we calculate from our progradation rate in the caves in Buchan in Eastern Victoria. So there seems to be something big going on, um, but I don't know what it is. Um, and the, the coincidence, as I mentioned before, of timing with the onset of the peculiar volcanism that we have in the Western District is also suspicious. Um, but again, I don't know what that would be, whether we're seeing some you know, circulation related to that volcanism that's upwelling the whole of Southeast Australia. I don't know. And again, there's people here who know way more about that um, than me, but I wish I knew. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot of yeah, Martin says thank you. Um, okay, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of um, thank yous and so on in the chat. I don't think there's any more questions specifically, so you should have a look at the look at the chat before we um, before we finish. But I will I will uh, point out that now would be the time for um, for us to pass over to any early career people who want to have a chat with Sandra. Um, and so I'll just say thank you again on behalf of everyone else and, uh, and, and hand over, I think, to, to Boone to manage that. Okay, thanks, so thank Louis. you, Sandra. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sandra. So whoever wants to stay back, uh, feel, um, I know that we are open to early career and students, but if any faculty member wants to stay on for an additional discussion, feel free to stay on and then we shall stop recording. This is a really good idea you have to allow the 